needed to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack, and he, this, he tore their clothes. And then they loaded all their donkeys and returned to the city. You have no idea what I'm talking about. Sit down. <laughs> I want to talk to you about the story of Joseph today. Joseph was a young man, and he had the favor of his father. We've been talking about how parents play favorites. And what a terrible thing it's been all through the Bible. When you have a child, do not play favorites. Here's how you do it, even if you secretly have one. You tell that child, you are my favorite, and then say their name in the world. I've got three boys. I've got a favorite Jason, a favorite James, and a favorite David. They are my favorite because there's nobody like them, and I am called as a parent to love them as best I can in spite of their differences because there's some days I love Jason, and then there's some days I love David, and then Jason's not so great anymore, and David's better, and then David has a bad day, and Jason's looking pretty good. Let me just tell you something. Raise kids you like. Because if you don't, you're going to be in trouble. And learn how to love your children. Joseph was the favorite. And he was so favored that his dad made him a coat that was beautifully crafted and colored in a very unique way. But that wasn't the worst of it. Let me just tell you something. When God shares something with you, and it has to do with your family, Keep it to yourself until it's revealed. Joseph walks in with his coat of many colors and says, guess what? God revealed to me in a dream. You boys are all bowing down to me. Now, if it wasn't enough that he had the coat of many colors, if it wasn't enough that he was the favorite, now he was telling all his brothers, most of them who were older than him, Ten of them, older than him, only his younger brother Benjamin. I am going to be in charge. Oh, that's fun to say, isn't it? To your brothers especially. <laughs> I've got four little brothers. And they, as I grew up, learned how to dislike me with a fervor I did not think possible. <laughs> But as we got older and things went along, we learned how to love each other better. But if my little brother would have come to me and said, not only am I the favorite, you know dad loves me more than he loves you. You're all going to bow down to me. We'd have ran him out of the, out of the house. And that's exactly what happened to Joseph. They sold him into slavery. They took that coat of many colors and they covered it with animal's blood. They took it back to their dad and said, he died. His dad was grieved beyond measure. Joseph is sold into slavery and ends up down in Egypt. Ends up being a success even as a slave. God blessed him. Rose to the top of the household of Potiphar's house. Then Potiphar's wife saw a good-looking slave and when her husband was away, she tried to take advantage of the situation and seduce Joseph. Joseph refuses that temptation of the flesh and ends up in jail. For all of his efforts, he ends up in jail. Not sure what to do, he began to be a success in jail. Ended up being second in command to the jailer. And when the king's butler and all the other people who got in trouble with the pharaoh would come in and have a problem, he'd reveal the dreams that they had. And after all the things, all the things settled, he ends up interceding with the Pharaoh himself and interpreting the Pharaoh's dream and ends up second in command of one of the greatest countries of the ancient world, in the land of Egypt and in the land of the ancient Pharaoh. Having in the dream been shown what would happen in the future, he saw seven years of great blessing and seven years of famine. He prepared huge places of grain to hold the grain, big silos of grain, as a matter of fact, they've looked back through the archaeological sites in ancient Egypt, 
and they found these ancient places where the Egyptians built these huge silos beyond anything that they'd even thought was possible in that ancient time. And we know that for a fact, when we look back to that time in history, that that was the exact same time that the Bible said Joseph was building those huge silos for grain. And, and, and here Joseph is, after all these years, he's been married off to the, the daughter of the high priest of the Pharaoh, which is like one of the greatest honors that you could... So here he has these, all these honors. And as the famine increases, and as Egypt is the only place for food, even his own family was starving to death up there in the land of promise. They came down to Egypt to buy food, and who did they run into at the top of the heap? Their own brother. And here's the thing. He was so duded up in all his Egyptian stuff, they didn't even recognize him. He was in such a position of power and authority, he made that robe he'd been given by his dad look like the castoffs from Goodwill. I mean, what he had wearing, he was wearing gold and all this stuff and a big diadem thing, and you know, you could see a big conical hat on his head sitting up there on the thing he was the man and they came in didn't even know who he was and got down and bowed down to him but the bible says they only brought 10 of the brothers so he gave them all the food and all the silver they brought he returned in their bags when they got to the resting place and saw all the silvers back in their bags they thought what in the world's going on they went home to their dad and the only thing Joseph sent him home with was this. If you ever come back, bring the whole family. Bring your other brother that you haven't brought. See, they brought everybody but Benjamin. And Benjamin was his brother with the love of Jacob's life. Rachel. And those two brothers were close. But because Jacob had already lost his son Joseph, he said, I cannot send Benjamin down there with you. At least in my old age, I have Benjamin to keep me happy. He was still playing favorites. Jacob didn't even go back to Egypt until he was 130 years old. Didn't go down to Egypt until he was 130 years old. You would think after 129 years, he would have had a little more sense in how he treated his own children, but he was still playing favorites. As the story goes, he was finally convinced to send Benjamin back down there because they ran out of grain and they were hungry again. He goes down there and meets with his brothers. And it says that when Joseph saw his brother Benjamin walk into that great court and that great arena, that great hall where they were transferring all of this food and all this grain was being transmitted and transported all the different places, this great hall that they were in. It says when Joseph saw his brother Benjamin and his brothers come back, he could not contain himself and he left and he wept. And then he came back and he comprised and devised a plan that he was going to take his own special silver cup and he was going to put it in the grain sack of his brother Benjamin and he's going to play a trick on him. So he sends him away with all their silver and this little, this special cup that he drank out of himself, put it in his brother Benjamin's bag. And that's where we picked up this story. Where they've left Egypt and he sends his steward after them, and he says, I want you to see what's in your bags. And they look through all the bags, and there in that grain bag for Benjamin was Joseph's own silver chalice. To me, it wasn't just a little cup, you know, a little cast-off cup. No, it was the special cup for Joseph himself. Puts that in his bag, his own brother. So here are his brothers coming back to him. And in my mind, this is where Joseph's dream finally comes true. Because his brothers know they're in trouble. They've stolen something from a man who's been nothing but generous to them. And they found the cup in the brother's bag that their father is most scared of losing. Benjamin. And as those brothers stand before 
Joseph, they get down on their knees and they humbly begin to beg for their lives because Joseph had the power to kill them all. Only one brother stood, the fourth son of Jacob, a man by the name of Judah. And Judah stands before Joseph, who he doesn't know, and he says this, I've got to tell you that when I came down here, I promised my father I would bring Benjamin home. So on my life, let me take his place. Do not do anything to my brother Benjamin. Whatever you're going to do, do it to me. I take full responsibility, and I give you my life for his. And when Joseph heard those words, he began to cry out. And he, he ordered all the Egyptian servants out of the room. Anybody who's Egyptian, you're out. And he looked at his brothers, and he told them who he was. Now, you can imagine the shock on Reuben's face, because he was the one that was for sure going to kill him. Jews the one that said, hey, guys, let's just sell him on slavery. Simeon and Levi, they were men of, of wrath and anger. You can only imagine what they were. Naphtali, Dan, all the rest of the boys. Standing there before Joseph, kneeling there before Joseph, all the emotions that they went through, all the things that they thought they had hidden for all of these years were now revealed to be nothing but falsehood, and they had to look at themselves in the mirror in that moment and examine who they were. Boy, I tell you, I would not give anything. I would, I, I would, I would never, ever want to be in that kind of a situation. Because let me just tell you something. Whatever's going on in your family will be revealed. You men, you think you have a secret sin? You don't. You women, you think you have a guilty pleasure? You don't. Everything that you do in your families will be revealed. It will come out and people will know it. And you will know it. And in that moment, as you stand before the Joseph in your family, or you kneel before the Joseph in your family, you will have to bear the consequences for how you live before God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing in my life I want more than be able to stand before my family and have them know who I am. What I live for is what my family will say about me when I'm gone. The greatest legacy that you will have. Now, let me just tell you something in case you're thinking, oh, Pastor Matt, you have the perfect family and everything's wonderful and you don't have any problems. You've done all the right things, blah, blah, blah. Here I am sitting in my mess. Thank you very much. Now, listen, let me tell you something. Every family struggles. Every family has some skeletons in the closet. Every family needs redemption. Every family needs God's grace, and mine especially. There's not one of us that stands before God and says, you know, like <laughs> the guy in the, in the scripture where it says, this Pharisee came to pray before God. He said, oh, God, I'm so thankful I'm not as other men. Oh, I'm sure God looked at him and said, yeah, whatever. And you got another guy over there saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I say that in that way. God, be merciful to us and help us as families because what's going on in your family will be revealed. There will be no secrets. It will be revealed. And so you need to be very careful how you live your life. Don't think you're keeping anything secret from God or anybody else because it will be revealed. As Joseph revealed his love to his brothers, he did not do so with condemnation. He did so with tears. He cried. He was broken. He wasn't gloating. He didn't say, hey, boys, you remember that dream I told you about before you threw me in the pit and sold me into Egypt to slavery? Deal with it. Was that his heart? Was that his attitude? No. It was a heart of humbleness and humility. Grief mixed with overwhelming joy that he would be finally reunited with his brothers. And then he asked the question, is my father still living? And when he heard that, 
I can't imagine what he felt like. Because the greatest power of love that you can express is most often discovered within your own family. God has called us to love each other. And in spite of all the family dynamics and drama we may have, when Jesus established his church, he had a Joseph that had raised him and loved him and encouraged him and lived for him. And he stood there, Jesus did, before the cross and before time and before eternity, he stood once again before the grave and he said, as a lion of the tribe of Judah, because I want you to know Jesus was a direct descendant of the Judah who stood before Joseph and said, take him, take me, but don't take him. Take my life, but don't take his. Jesus stood before time and eternity and said the very same things to every one of us. Before God in the throne room of heaven, he says, Lord, God, I have paid the price. Take me. Spare him. And we live into that moment every day of the story of the family that we're a part of. Because we have been grafted into that family. And as Jesus established his church, he called us brothers and sisters. He said, who is my family? Who is my brother? Who is my sister? It is those who follow me and keep my commands. And you are here today as part of that family. And it doesn't matter how broken or messed up your past may have been. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. You're a part of this family. And we celebrate what that means. And then, my final thought for you this morning. Just as Judah took ownership for his own actions, I have to ask you this question. Have you taken ownership of your own actions? Because how you take ownership of your own actions will define the future that you're going to have and the future of those you love. It's never too late to take the opportunity to say, I am sorry. I will endeavor to do better in the future. Whatever has happened in my past, I will give it a decent burial and by the grace of God, I will move forward. And let me just tell you something. God never asked one of his disciples for a resume. Not one. He already knew their resume. And God already knows your resume too. And if he can love you and forgive you, then you can love and forgive yourself and love others around you. God is calling us to be a family that still believes in miracles. I still believe in miracles. I believe what God is doing in your life and in my life is a miracle each day, and we're going to live into that future with the hope and the blessing that comes from knowing what it means to live fully surrendered to who God wants us to be. More of you, less of me. Lester, would you come back as we close our service today? I'd like for you to sing that song with us that you were singing just a moment ago. More of you, less of me. And as we sing that song, would you stand with me as we close our service today?
Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence and worship you. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, you know all the things that are happening, all the things that are going on in the world around us. But the thread that runs through history is the story of your love and your grace for each one of us. And we're a part of your family, Jesus. here together as brother and sisters in Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that you would go with us into the world this week, that you would help us to live with the faith and the trust and the hope that you've called us to live into. And whatever we're facing, whatever we're going through, Lord, we do it together. We do it with you, and our faces shine towards the horizon of eternity that you have lit with your perfect love. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. So now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. May he turn his countenance towards you with a smile and give you his peace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.